bed of a dying dear old friend and talked about what Jesus said how someday we'd live again he held his Bible to his chest as he slowly slipped away but before he took his final breath I heard my daddy say it's true I can hear the angels singing, it's true. Heaven's bells are ringing, I can see the face of my Jesus, and He's coming for me. It's true, I see loved ones who are waiting. Things of earth are fading. I'll be waiting on the other side for you. It's true. I know that there will come a day when death will call for me, and they will put my body in the ground. But that's not where I'll be. When I have those fears and doubts About what lies ahead I'll just think about my dear old dad And the last two words he said It's true I can hear the angels singing bells are ringing I can see the face of my Jesus and he's coming for me it's true I see loved ones who are waiting it's true the things of earth are fading I'll be waiting on the other side for you. I'll be waiting. Genesis, chapter number 9. Glad for another opportunity to be gathered together with the church body today. Let's all stand to our feet for a few minutes here. Let's give you a chance to stretch your legs, get the blood flowing, and Heighten your level of attention here for the next few minutes uh, while we read the Word of God, our, our primary text, at least this morning, the book of Genesis, chapter number 9. We're going to begin our reading in verse number 20. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. 
And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. <clears throat> our Father and our God, we are grateful to you this morning for the opportunity once again to open up the <clears throat> this precious book, the word that you have preserved for us. Just thank you this morning that you have been faithful to every generation of man to continue to preserve these truths, that we could study them and be instructed by them. I pray that this morning you would incline our ears and that we would have inclined hearts to know wisdom and to receive instruction, that we might uh, be noble in our faith as those who hear and are taught and ask faithfully, what wilt thou have me to do? Our Father, we're thankful just for all the things you've given us in Christ this morning, for the peace and joy that are ours through him. Just pray, pray that he might be lifted up and glorified through the services today. We ask it in his name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. <clears throat> so not a lot written about Noah and his family and what they did with their lives in the years after the flood. We know that Noah continued to live um, for 350 years after the flood. That's a lot of time. That's longer than this nation has been a nation. <clears throat> so 350 years Noah spent um, being a, uh, a father and a grandfather and probably a great-grandfather and a great-great-great-grandfather. I uh, don't know how many generations. I could have looked it up and done the math. <clears throat> but we have a lot of history, but we only have just this one story of that 350 years of what Noah and his sons were up to after the flood. So you might remember the story of the flood. Anybody remember the story of the flood? How many people came off the ark to inhabit the earth? <clears throat> eight people. Somebody said six. That's not correct. It was eight people. There was three sons and their wives, and there was Noah and his wife. <clears throat> Peter says eight souls saved by water. So they come off the earth, right? And it was great. There was no property taxes. Um, there was nothing. Like you just pick your place to live and you could have it because nobody else had spoken for it yet. So the whole earth was before these eight people and nothing is recorded beyond what happens immediately after them leaving the ark and God making his covenant with Noah. We have this one story and it's very instructive. Very instructive. And I want to take just a few minutes to look at this this morning. So Noah plants a vineyard, right? He comes off and decides to be a husbandman. So he plants a vineyard. We know that they had taken all the uh, fruits of the earth and seed and all this kind of stuff onto the ark. And so they began to uh, keep the earth and to repopulate it. And he plants a vineyard. <clears throat> and so they obviously have carried some knowledge with them from the old world that, uh, that they brought with them. And so Noah decides to make some wine. I don't believe that Noah would have been ignorant of what happens to wine when it ferments. Uh, I'm sure drunkenness was not new to Noah after the flood. Probably he had seen a lot of it before the flood. So interestingly enough, here we have this, this man who's uh, on the one hand a tremendous testimony of faith to us, listed in Hebrews chapter number 11 among the great cloud of witnesses <clears throat> because he had built this ark, he had uh, saved his house and really the entire human race and yet coming off the ark and now uh, wondering what he's going to do with his time he decides to plant a vineyard he starts making wine and next thing you know we have him drunk in his tent right <clears throat> so it's not a story about Noah that you hear a lot about uh, but this is part of his story so he has this wine he obviously uh, partakes of too much of it and because he was warm and everything else he goes in his tent whatever the story is uh, and he undresses himself to try to to cool off because he's hot so he's in his tent so there's some things about this story that are odd and strange right <clears throat> one why is Noah getting drunk that seems weird two if he's in his tent why can't we just leave the man alone like do we have to go in do we have to worry about what, what dad is doing in his tent? Third, we have the idea of nakedness, something that seems to be a shame that's lost on our society today. But these, this, is, this is important, what's taking place here is, is going to be really important. 
And it's set forth in the scriptures by the Holy Spirit for a reason. There's a reason that of all the accounts the Holy Spirit could have given us about the life of Noah, this is the one that he chose. Right? This, this is the story that the Holy Spirit chose to preserve in the scriptures. And it's written for our instruction. Right? It's written for our instruction. So there's some odd things you kind of wonder about. And we're going to kind of study through a few of them. You wonder why did Canaan get cursed? He's not even mentioned until Noah uh, says that he's cursed and it doesn't seem that he was actually involved uh, because Ham is the one who's responsible right it says that Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his son had done to him and that's an interesting phrase in and of itself his son did something to him now we're not told exactly what that is <clears throat> but it's it's interesting that the curse that Noah pronounces against Canaan is given in this context. And so let's just take a look at this this morning and see if we can sort out some of the uh, strangeness of it and then see if there's some application that we can learn. Because I think in our own day and age, there's something really important, really fundamental in this verse and in this passage, I should say, that's being taught, that's actually echoed in other places of Scripture. We're going to look at one other place in Scripture where this same principle is echoed, but you have to remember that this is an age before the law. Right? There was no law given uh, that Ham was instructed by other than the law of conscience, right? The, the natural revelation that God had given to man about right and wrong that they knew in their conscience when they violated those principles, they knew themselves they had done wrong and they judged other people for doing things that they said were wrong. So they're proving they have the capacity to discern right and wrong or good and evil. And so they didn't have those things given specifically, but nonetheless, Ham is accountable. Uh, and Noah, it's odd too that Noah, if there's only eight of you coming off the ark and we now have grandchildren in the picture, so there's there's uh, more people that have either uh, been born um, just immediately after, and so we don't know exactly how much time has gone by, but there's other people around. There's not a lot of people, and it's interesting to find Noah cursing one of his own sons. That's, that's the thing Noah does coming off the ark, and what was the ark uh, a picture of? Wasn't it um, God's destruction of all of humanity other than Noah and his family because of sin? So they had this example of the judgment of God, the power of God, and of God's um, judgment concerning evil doing, They had all of these benefits, and it certainly wasn't lost on them. So Ham, in verse number 22, going in <clears throat> to the tent, we don't know why he went in. Uh, we don't know any of the details around, maybe like most sons, he wanted to borrow some tools from dad, or, you know, Dad had a blender that he wanted to use or dad had something that he needed. It was in, oh, I think I left it in dad's tent or dad has one of those. I'll go borrow it. So he goes in and this is what he discovers. Now, I want you to pay attention to how the circumstances that present themselves reveal the heart and nature of these three brothers. Because everything that they're confronted with is strictly circumstantial. It's their response to the circumstances that manifests the blessings and the curse. So circumstance would have it that Noah's drunk in his tent. And circumstance just has it that Ham happens to be the son that goes in first and sees his father laying in his own tent and he has uncovered himself he's taken his clothes off now this was um this is a very serious matter in scriptural terms the the lord has a lot to say about whose nakedness you're allowed to see or uncover and, and the lord actually spends a lot of time <laughs> When you, when you study the idea of nakedness, the Lord spends a lot of time in Scripture laying down very clearly, especially for His people, whose nakedness you're allowed to see and whose nakedness you're not allowed to look upon. He actually spends an unusual amount of time talking about that very subject. And so it's interesting we have that same thing here before the law is given in precept or in principle. So Ham, the father of Canaan, 
saw the nakedness of his father. Now that in and of itself ought not happen. Does it mean that circumstantially Ham was condemned because he walked in and his dad happened to be uncovered and he saw it? No, but these circumstances are going to reveal something about Ham that Noah recognizes. See, a lot of people think that Noah placed a curse on Ham. I don't think that's what's happening. He doesn't place a curse on Ham. He calls it out. Ham was cursed of God. And Noah, I think, recognizes that fact. He doesn't place a curse on him. He recognizes you have brought the curse of God upon yourself. When you study curses in Scripture, I want to talk a little bit about this, but when you study curses in Scripture, they're nearly always a response to the creature's own decisions, the creature's own choices. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree, what happened? The, the, actually, the Lord cursed the ground for their sake. When the serpent tempted Adam and Eve, he was cursed because he seduced Adam and Eve. When Cain slew his brother Abel, he was cursed because he slew his brother Abel. Right? We see this over and over again all through Scripture. Uh, the book of Malachi deals with this in general with the nation of Israel about how they're uh, under a curse because they have robbed God. They have done all these things. It's, those, it's that conduct. And so what God is revealing is that these, these uh, areas of sinfulness are what place you under the curse of God, which we know to be true. Paul says that the, he talks about the curse of the law. Now, he's not saying that the law was a curse. The law is good. But it becomes a curse to us because we can't keep it. And so the more God adds law, what does it do? It reveals that we are cursed children in our natural unbelieving condition. So this idea of cursing comes into play here uh, for the first time since we saw it before the flood with what happened in the garden and then Cain being cursed uh, by God for his murder of his brother. And then we don't see that really again until after the flood. And here it shows up again immediately after God's judgment of man. We have this idea of cursed again. So Ham sees his father's nakedness. And now he's confronted with what do I do about this? What do I do? This has just happened. Have you ever just had something happen to you? It's not like you signed up for this to happen. It's not like Ham necessarily got up that morning and was trying to devise a way to catch his dad unaware and catch him naked. I don't think Ham was necessarily set out to do that. But the circumstances just so happened. And now you're left with, what do I do with the circumstances I've been given? You know, really, that is the thrust of our life. What do I do with the circumstances I've been given? Here's what Ham decides to do. He saw the nakedness of his father, and what did he immediately go do? He went and told his brethren without. You know, Solomon talks about how uh, love uh, or a faithful friend and different things, different proverbs that he tells that I won't, I won't allude to because I'm not going to steal Adam's thunder in Sunday school. Uh, but he talks about how uh, that conceals a matter, right? It conceals a matter. What did Ham immediately decide to go do? Go tell his brothers, which carries with it uh, a certain amount of irreverence for his father, a lack of respect for his father, that he would choose to dishonor his father. And the context seems to be, and we don't know explicitly, but it seems to be that this must have carried some kind of a, uh, at least a bit of a mockery with it uh, to, to mock his father, or at least perhaps maybe to our Sunday school lesson this morning, enticing his brothers 
to enjoy having a good laugh at dad's expense, right? Oh, guys, you won't believe it. Dad got drunk. It's the funniest thing. You've got to come see. Right? You, can almost, you can almost hear the conversation as it unfolds. And we've all known people like this. And my guess is at times we've all been people like this. That we see something and rather than having a faithful response to it, we decide to yuck it up and we get other people involved. The next thing you know, we're not only engaged in uh, slander, but also in um, really demeaning behavior to try to just have a laugh at someone else's expense. This is kind of the attitude we see in Ham. Shim and Japheth did something very respectable and admirable that was uh, probably put Ham on his heels a little bit. Because when brother comes to you and says, hey, guys, guess what is so funny? We got to go, go check this out. When Shim and Japheth are saying no, that has, has an effect on the person that's trying to entice you to do evil. You're saying, no, we're not, not interested in doing that. Interesting, their response, right? So now they're confronted with a circumstance. What do Shim and Japheth do? This is what they did. They took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders. I want you to just think about the world we live in today when, when nakedness is not a big thing. These, this is their dad. He's not well. And this is, this is how they're going to honor their father. They put a garment between them on their shoulders and the two of them together, almost as two witnesses bearing testimony against Ham and what he did, saying, no, that's, that's a very dishonorable thing. And before the law was ever given that says, honor your father, the spirit of God was bearing witness through the conscience, you ought to honor your father. And that's what Shem and Japheth are doing. They put a coat on their shoulders and they walk it in backwards to the tent. And without even looking, all they do is just very respectfully cover up their father. And then they leave the tent. That's all they did. It's a pretty simple act of kindness, right? I mean, you wouldn't think this is, you know, the kind of thing that would merit some enormous blessing in favor of God. And if you're ham, you wouldn't think that this little joke, just a little joke on dad, it was funny. You wouldn't think this little joke would carry, well, what could the consequences possibly be? This is a little thing. In both cases, these are small acts. It's a small act of disobedience, honestly, tell your brothers it's funny who hasn't done that in a family share a funny story about something it's probably not what what you ought to do but it happens taking a coat in covering up dad a small act of charity a small act of kindness they saw not their father's nakedness and noah awoke from his wine in other words he sobered up and came back to his senses and had his understanding and he knew what his younger son had done unto him. In other words, it carries the idea of a transgression. It carries the idea of an offense. He did something to Noah. Now, what would Ham's, what would the first thing Ham would say? We've all known people like Ham. What's the first thing they would say? I didn't do anything, right? Protest, I didn't do anything. The scripture says he did something to him. He did something to his father. He dishonored him. He failed to show the proper amount of reverence and respect for his father. Now, you and I might think, what's the big deal? And it's a fair question. What is the big deal? Apparently, it was a big deal. Noah wakes up. He's a little hot under the collar so to speak and this is how he responds he said cursed be Canaan 
And then you're left asking, what did Canaan have to do with anything? Now, we don't know. It's, it's possible that Canaan first discovered the facts and told his father Ham, and then his father Ham went and told the brothers. Possible. But that's speculation. We don't know. But this is what we do know. That a father who fails to understand the importance of reverence seems to bring a curse on his own children. A father who fails to understand the importance of respect and reverence seems to bring a curse on his own children. It's an interesting turn. You know, the Bible over and over talks about how the Lord recompenses our ways on our own heads. And it's interesting that Ham's failure to honor Noah ends up in a curse on his son. Now, Ham probably didn't anticipate that fact. And again, I don't think that Noah is necessarily placing a curse on Canaan as much as calling out the truth that people who conduct themselves this way are cursed. They're cursed of God. And we see that over and over in Scripture, that those who choose to act wickedly and sinfully are cursed of God. Ultimately, we know all of us are under the curse, is why Christ went to the cross to be made a curse for us. So what is this idea of cursed? When he curses Canaan, to curse means to make powerless. The idea is to bind someone. Often they're bound for destruction, right? As opposed to the liberty we have in Christ, there are those who are reserved in chains, right? We read about that in scripture. So it has this idea of binding or of being thwarted, restricted, or hindered with obstacles, when the Lord told Cain he was cursed from the earth, it means that Cain, or Cain was going to be hindered by obstacles that God put in his way. Now, there's, there's certainly many times when things will get in our way in this life, right? We get in our own way a lot in this life. There are some things that just are common to men that relate to difficulty. But the picture is this, that if God has blessed us, then it doesn't matter who else opposes us. We will face opposition, but if God is for us, the opposition ultimately will fail. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper and all the rest. But the contrary wise is also true, that no matter how big of a coalition we build, if God is against us, it will not prevail. And so when God has said he is going to be against us that's a problem for us and that's exactly what Canaan is being told and Ham is being told that there's you are going to be hindered with obstacles all of your posterity as opposed to the blessings and it's interesting that it's because of the the disobedience of Ham and I think it's just fascinating the way the Lord works in these circumstances that it's because Ham conducted himself irreverently, that's what created the opportunity for Shem and Japheth to be blessed. Do you see that? It's because Ham went and betrayed his father to his brothers that his brothers had the opportunity to have a faithful response. And thereby, they acquired the blessing from Noah when he's speaking to his sons. So Ham secures a blessing for, or a, um, Ham secures a curse for his descendants through Canaan. Shem and Japheth are told they will be blessed of the Lord because of their faithful dealings with their father. And it's even more fascinating that the story the Holy Spirit chose to use for us has very little to do with the uh, perceived worth of the one who should be reverenced. In other words, Noah's conduct in this story isn't necessarily one that you would think is deserving of reverence. But that's exactly the issue. We're not called to reverence people 
based on their character, we're commanded to reverence people because of our character. That if we have that godly character given us in Christ, that the reverence we show is because of our character, not based on the value or worth of the other person's character that we're commanded to reverence. So Ham goes about this all wrong, and he occasions this curse on his household by which he is told that he is going to be hindered uh, and set apart from his brothers to be their servants, and he would be hindered in his life. So we have this idea of all through Scripture, the serpent being cursed, the ground being cursed, Cain being cursed, Canaan being cursed, uh, all these things. Uh, and if we go to Second Kings, I want to find another example here, and then we'll get to the main point. What the, what's the application? What's the takeaway? There's a lot of different stories you could look at, but there's another fascinating one here in the book of 2 Kings that will probably be familiar to some of you. Chapter number 2. Beginning in verse number 22. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And he, that is Elisha, went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and did what? Mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. Now, little kids, they're just being, just being little kids. You know how little kids will be? Yeah. Uh, I heard recently, I thought it was funny, it's Sean, you know, he says they're vipers, little vipers in diapers or whatever. And <laughs> I heard another preacher say, you know, that's a real slander to vipers. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of more truth than that when you'd like to admit. Yeah. Little children, right? I mean, no, just youths, just children, just youths. They go out and they begin to mock the prophet of God. Why do you think a young person would choose that kind of conduct? Because they've never been restrained by their parents. Reverence was not important in their household. It wasn't taught. Why? Because it's not a big deal. Well, it wasn't a big deal until this day. When all these kids run out of the city and they begin to make fun of the bald head of the prophet. Now, of all the things you would think would bring um, the hand of God's judgment against you, especially against these children, would just be making fun of somebody because they're bald. I mean, it's just a joke, right? We were just having a laugh. It's just good fun. Elisha didn't think it was just good fun because it's not about the bald head. It's not any more about the bald head than it was about Noah being naked in his tent. If Noah's naked in his tent, he's in his tent. Leave him alone, right? The man doesn't have any hair on his head. Okay, what's the big deal? That one circumstance, just the baldness of, of the prophet's head, provided the occasion to manifest the hearts of these children. And notice what happens. Elisha turned back, and it's just such a strong response from the prophet. He looks back. He looked on them. In other words, he sets his eyes. He fixes his gaze on them. And what does he do? He cursed them in the name of the Lord. And you might know the rest of the story. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood. And what happened? And tear. Tear is a fancy word for means ripped in pieces. And tear forty and two children of them. 
What was their sin? What was their crime? Was it so bad of a crime to just make fun of the prophet because he's bald? It's just a joke. The Lord sent two bears to tear 42 of these young people into pieces because of the same crime they committed that Ham committed. And it shows, at least in principle, the importance of reverence. Teaching children the importance of reverence. This, these occasions show, in other words, it brings out the conduct that God says is cursed. Noah identifies it. Elisha calls it out. And God reveals his judgment about this kind of behavior and conduct. In other words, when Elisha curses them in the name of the Lord, again, I don't know that he's placing a curse on them the way we think of like placing a hex on them. He's simply making them aware that because of your heart, you are under the curse of God. That kind of conduct manifests a creature that is under the curse of God. And God backs it up with the circumstances of the bears that come out of the woods and tear these kids to pieces. Now, all the parents of these children are probably mad at God. How could this happen to little Johnny? He was a good kid. He just got in with the wrong crowd. Right? Little Johnny, he was just, I mean, at all these kids' funerals, you already know the kind of things that were being said. How wonderful they were, how great they were, how loving and how kind these children were. But what did God say? Saying, look at the fruits of their mouths. This idea of reverence, there's a reason that in the Ten Commandments, God said, honor your father and your mother. Because learning reverence doesn't end in the home, but it must start in the home. If children do not learn reverence in the home, they won't have any reverence out of the home. For their father, they have no reverence. And now we're out of the home with the prophet of God and no reverence for the prophet of God. Why? Because the only thing they respect is their own ideas and thinking and people who like to live as wickedly as they do. It's interesting that all these kids seem to be running together in a group. So this idea of reverence shows up over and over again. We're even taught in the New Testament over and over again repeatedly. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor is due. We live in a culture and in a day and age when reverence is thought very little of. Because we seem to only reciprocate with a measure of reverence based on what we think the person is worthy of, based on their conduct. Not understanding that that says more about us than it does them. It says more about us. Our children, if they're going to learn reverence, they have to learn it in the home. Did you know reverence and gratitude or appreciation, they absolutely go hand in hand? They absolutely, you will not have any reverence or render any honor to anyone that you don't appreciate or value. Give me one example of someone you hold in reverence that you don't think much of. You will not hold people in reverence if you do not properly appreciate and value them. That's why we're told in the New Testament that we're reminded that all those who are in authority were put there by God. And we're told to honor them. We often get ourselves into this frame of mind that says, well, I don't have to respect them because they X, Y, and Z. And as I said, that reveals more about us than it does them. Paul says that there's necessarily going to be heresies among us. In other words, we'll get up here and we'll talk about these things 
and some will believe and some will not. And that's the way churches have been since the very first one with the 12. There was 11 who believed. There was one who did not. And every church body since has been comprised of some who believe, some who do not. They all say they believe, but not all of them take the instruction of God to heart. In other words, circumstantially, when things just happen, there's always your hams. And there will be a few Japheths and Shems. And so the circumstances simply provide the occasion to draw out the character and the heart of the person. Right? There's always going to be little children like this who have no respect because they've never been taught they have to. And I say this to remind us as parents, you must hold a position of reverence in your children's eyes. And you must teach them that they must honor those to whom honor is due. Why did we always make such a big deal with our children of answering adults when you're spoken to? Or of shaking hands when somebody's, if somebody's talking to you, you're going to answer them and you're going to talk back. Why do we make such a big deal about that when our children are one and two and three years old? Because they must learn reverence. Ham never learned it. These young people never learned it. And what the Bible reveals over and over again is that the people who don't learn it are cursed of God. Reverence is a big deal. Teaching respect, showing respect, having honor to whom honor is due. And uh, reverence ultimately learned in the home is designed to lead us to have the proper reverence for God himself. Malachi 1, 6-8, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? If God is your father, then where is his honor? If I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? He says, ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? In other words, giving God your scraps and your leftovers, right? Oh, I'll donate this to the church because I'm getting a new one, right? That kind of thing. Giving God the leftovers. And so the Lord asks a very simple question. He says, offer that unto your governor. Will he be pleased with thee? See, we sometimes feel, and this is, what, this is what the Lord is revealing to these people. Because they're saying, well, God's demanding our best. <clears throat> and all God is saying is, all I'm doing is pointing out that you don't want me to have your best. The fact that we feel like God's demanding our best means you don't want to give it to him. Right. Which is the problem. The problem is the heart. And God's just holding up a mirror, just saying, look in there. Why don't you want me to have the best? You say I'm your father. Where's my honor? You say I'm your master. Where's my fear? He's saying it doesn't make sense. It's irrational. Because you don't conduct yourselves that way on the temporal plane among yourselves. And yet I'm God. And you expect me to be pleased when you honor me with this? It's not honorable. You don't think it's honorable. If someone brought over their uh, broken stuff because they thought maybe you could fix it and they bought a new one, would you think, oh, they love me? No. You would think they loved you if they bought you a nice brand new one. Right? Just offer the best. God's calling them out again so that they can see. These things circumstantially reveal our nature. 
They don't create it or produce it. Shem and Japheth didn't become blessed because they reverenced their father. They were blessed because they had a desire to reverence their father. All they needed was an opportunity to show their reverence to their father, and they did. Ham didn't reverence his father, and all he needed was an opportunity to show that he didn't reverence his father. And interestingly, God gave him one. And thereby, the curse is placed upon his son, identifying that that right there is exactly the kind of person that is cursed of God. So that we might be instructed. Because many of us have done similar kind of things in our lives, but God, the Holy Spirit, other than through His Word, has never come down and told us in our ear, you're cursed because you did that. But the Word of God tells us that we are. Because we see it in the Scriptures. Learning reverence begins in the home. The commandments were given to the nation of Israel, and then they were told to teach them diligently to their children. Why? So that it would be well with them. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 12, 9. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 9. <clears throat> Dealing with this father-son relationship and the necessary chastening and disciplining that comes with that relationship, we're told in verse number 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. What's the purpose of discipline? To correct. Because by nature, children do not possess wisdom. By nature, those little children that went out there making fun of the prophet, that's what they do by nature. If you take any child, you leave them to themselves, and you let them get old enough to just use language, they're going to make fun of the things of God. They'll make fun of the man of God. They're going to make fun of their parents. They'll just, that's their nature is to mock and make fun. It's what they want to do. And so unrestrained, that is what they will do. And so we are to correct them. And he says it's through this correction process, something important is developed. What is it? Reverence. What produces reverence in the relationship between a parent and a child? It's not hugs. It's not kisses. It's not love notes. It's not extra peanut butter on the jelly sandwich. It's not just all the acts of affection that we think. Because sometimes parents become kind of deluded in their thinking to think that, well, I love them so much that if I just do nice things they'll do nice things. No, they don't. They take advantage of you because you're a sucker. You just keep providing them good stuff and they're like, hey, this is great. You're just useful to them. They don't love you. Children by nature come out self-serving and they learn reverence as they are corrected. When you let your child just follow their own natural inclination, they will be cursed of God. And parents who do not correct their children don't believe that. There's heresy among us. It's unbelief. You're saying, I do not believe God. My children will love me. They will be good. They will love God. They will be nice. And God's saying, no, they won't. They must be corrected because by nature, they're the enemies of God. But through this correcting process, reverence is developed. Notice what Paul says. We learn that in the home and then we make application in our relationship with God. 
He says that we, right, if we give reverence to them, shall not we much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits? In other words, the one who has fathered us in spirit, by whom we are born again. Should we not also be in subject to him and have his correction in our lives and live? So that relationship that we learn in the home should ultimately reflect the truth of how God deals with his children. And he deals with them faithfully. And what does that mean? It means he's always faithful to his word with them. But I say all of that to say we live in a day and age when everybody seems to recognize that there's a lack of reverence in general. But it's because it's not being taught in our homes. And it's probably because we don't think it's a big deal. When Canaan, let's just suppose for a moment that Canaan, the son of Ham, was the one who first saw Noah. And maybe that's why Noah placed the curse specifically on Canaan because Ham had other sons as well. So there's, there's some idea that Canaan might have been the one who tipped his dad off, right? So when Canaan comes to his dad, the fact that Canaan has no reverence for his grandfather doesn't even stand out to Ham because Ham has no reverence for his father. So he doesn't even see it as a problem because he lives the same way. How many parents, when you see your little children acting up or, or being ugly or being spiteful, and parents laugh, they think it's cute. I think it's funny. We just have a good laugh about it. But the problem is they grow up, and if they're uncorrected, they don't just stay where they are. They're on a trajectory. They're on a trajectory. And it's not like they're just going to kind of stay here close by. It's like, I don't know if you ever played with rockets when you were a kid. You shoot a rocket off and it's just three or four degrees one way. Next thing you know, when the rocket finally lands, it's 600 feet downfield. Just because it was three degrees or whatever, or five. Tim, Tim's sitting there doing the math and he's like, no, it's not five. But it's whatever. Depends on the velocity and whatever else, but there's some science there. <clears throat> right? No, we have to be with our children to correct them to teach them the importance of reverence we model it and we demonstrate to them the importance of it by holding them to account and so the sermon this morning is really just to look at two stories in scripture where seemingly small acts of irreverence what's the big deal right we live in the age of no big deal what's the big deal but i'm i'm just sharing with you that from god's perspective who's the judge as he looks at things he's seeing that's a big deal and oftentimes the things we dismiss and we're waiting for the big thing right so as a parent it's easy to think well i'm going to wait i'm going to pick my battles you know i'm going to pick my battles and i'm going to wait for the big ones um right and you can you can do that a little bit and wait till the big ones but you will lose them right because you've been losing them every step of the way and a lot of times parents wait till the kid's 16, 17, 18, and then they try to put their foot down and say what needs to happen. The kids are like, whatever. I, I don't have to listen to that. Right? I'm going to go do my own thing. Lack of reverence. Ham demonstrated it for his father, brought a curse upon him and his son, and at least identified that he was cursed of God. These children coming out of the city, just making fun of the bald prophet. What's the big deal? Um, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Children in this church, right? I've heard out of the mouths of some of the youth in this church slander against missionaries, preachers that have either been through here or that we've seen somewhere else, mocking them, making fun of them, either their appearance or whatever. God says you're cursed. Because that all it took was a bald head to draw that out. And apparently God thinks that's a big deal, whether or not we think it's a big deal. The Bible says in Psalm 89, 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. I think what John says as well in his 
epistle, if a man says he loves God, but doesn't love his brother, how can he claim to love God who he's never seen if he can't love his brother who's right here? The same is true of reverence. You can't possibly claim to have any reverence for God when you don't have any reverence for the people he's put right here that you can see that you're supposed to reverence. So it's meaningless. It's vain talk. It's empty words. A reverence is an important part of our Christian walk. It's an important part of the instruction our children deserve to receive from us because we're supposed to be teaching them the ways of the Lord. He thinks reverence is a big deal. He thinks uh, holding people in respect is important. And if we're failing to pass that on to our children, we are simply giving them over to the curse. We're simply giving them over to the curse that by nature they already come into this world that way and we're not doing anything to redirect their thinking or to hold them to account and say that's not acceptable you will not act that way and we do what's necessary to correct and change that so i use that sermon this morning because we have a lot of young people in this congregation which puts a lot of responsibility on a lot of parents who have children that need to be learning to show reverence. It's not their nature to show reverence. It's their nature when they come in the building, if an adult speaks to them, to put their head down and just walk past. That's their nature. It's also wicked. And that's why a parent has to be there to stop them in their tracks and say, absolutely not. You're going to speak to Mr. So-and-so. And you look him in the face while you're talking to him. And then you grab their little chin, put their face up, and make them talk. Why do you have to do that? Because they need correction. Or they're going to simply continue to go down the, the path that God has shown over and again in his word is a cursed way to walk. So if you love them, what should you do? Correct them. Don't let them go that way. That's the way they want to to go don't let them just go that way un, unrestrained do what you must and be reminded ourselves of the importance of reverence right those that God has put in authority those that God has put in your life whether that's for children it's your mother and your father for you wives it's your husbands for church people it's your pastor and I'm not just saying that because I happen to be the pastor um, but for all of us, it's our governor, it's our president, it's our elected officials. We ought to have those people in reverence because regardless of their character, ours should shine through. And actually, poor character on their part is what gives us the opportunity to show forth our character. It's exactly what Shem and Japheth recognized, and God blessed them for it. Amen. Brother Josh, if you come this morning, we'll all stand.